For those of us brought up on Pong and Pac-Man, the modern video game is a revelation, an immersive and increasingly realistic experience produced with often stunning creativity and artistry. Now a multi-billion dollar industry, games revenues now dwarf those of the movies, and games consoles have become ubiquitous media hubs. As the technology driving these games has developed, so the soundtrack has really blossomed. Once all electronic and simple, although often very catchy, now blockbuster games require blockbuster soundtracks, often recorded by full symphony orchestras. BAFTA now has a games music category, acknowledgement perhaps that it's time to take this genre seriously. James Hannigan has won that BAFTA and been nominated five times. He's one of the finest composers working in games today, with credits including Command and Conquer, The Lord of the Rings and the Theme Park series. Games that are hugely successful all around the world and that means that millions of people every single day are listening to Hannigan's music. The games industry had uh, always held uh, fascination for me. I played games as a, as a kid. And so I was very sort of um, intrigued by uh, the production of uh, games music. And it, music in games was actually going through a very interesting transition at that stage. Um, it was coming out of the so-called chip music era into the era of uh, digital music production. So all of a sudden, um, it was possible to uh, play back almost any music in games. Anything that could be recorded in games uh, could now be streamed from hard disk or uh, played back from CD. And uh, that really sort of interested me and uh, I felt sort of offered many, many opportunities uh, for the, well, to get involved in a, a new and emerging medium. If you don't know how something's created, there's a kind of magic with music. I think that if you you know if you get if you, you you can't analyze it you can't break it down and you sort of you just marvel at something that that adds something it's it's more than just the music it's the how is that done how is that achieved and I think that say chip music in particular uh, in early games held that kind of fascination to me I just wanted to know how to do it you know just uh, explain chip music uh, chip music is just music that um, you would use the underlying hardware of the console or uh, you know, the game system to generate the sounds they use. So the instrument was the, you know, the console or the, the, the sound chip. It had a uniqueness uh, and, a, and a language that was evolving and it was immediately identifiable. You knew what games music was when you heard it. So I sent a tape and a cassette tape to uh, EA and they, they offered me a job and uh, you know I, I took it because it, was, it just felt like a really good opportunity and even though as I say it wasn't really particularly well respected I think I could see that it, where it was heading and where it still is going you know I've, I've got great faith in it. I want to bring in Theme Park World because it's a game, for those of you who don't know, where you create your own theme park. But music-wise, this is an interesting one, even though it's a fairly early example of how you change the music to suit the yeah. event that you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, again, you know, when you show linear clips of old games, generally they don't impress. I mean, I've got to say that. Because, <laughs> you know, they, they're there to be played and not to be viewed. And... Uh, this is a classic example of that. Am I right in saying that when you, when you build the, your park, if you've only got one thing in it, let's say you've just got well, one, that's one what, it, it, you've got one exactly. very, very simple bit of music, yeah. but as you build it up, your music gets more and more that's why, complex. That's why uh, I think it, it won the BAFTA award that year. So this music kind of evolved as your park grew. So the, the more children there were in your theme park, the more rides, then the, busy, you know, the music became more and more dense and you know that would happen over 45 minutes or something mm. even though everything would be derived from one single track it was kind of stretching that track out when you're creating music for games very often you're not working to picture you know it, it, especially with this kind of god game if you like um, as they're called it's, it's sort of um, you don't know what's going to happen next it's all driven by the player so you can't really write music that imposes too much on the game. 
You know, there isn't a story because the player is creating that story and the story is their park. But you so, must be vaguely curious, at least. Yeah, but you see, but it's more of a concept. Say so the music is for situations and states. It's not sort of, uh, oh, you know, there's this sequence, uh, let's write some music for it. Um, all the music in, in that consisted of little segments, you know, four or eight bars, and those were endlessly being spliced together by the, the interactive music system. So, you know, you get to the end of one of these little bars, and that could be looped, or it could be followed by another one, and, you know, so there was this branching that was going on. So if the part gets busier, then, you know, it'll wait to get to the end of uh, the existing segment, go up a gear, then it will dip into a sort of bank of busier tracks, segments. So it's a kind of sentencing thing. You're just kind of creating these longer and longer sentences, but it's, in, it's entirely driven by the player. You know, it's the sort of the player is creating the story, so you, you're not telling a story with the music. It's just kind of, um, you know, completely determined by them. The thing that I've always wanted to do, but haven't always been successful in doing, uh, is trying to add a dimension to the games with music because, as I say, there's sometimes very little to work with. You know, you don't, you're not led by the picture all the time. You're led, you know, you have these situations. Uh, again, it's what you say with the music. So, for example, I mean, just, there's a, there was a, a manage, sports management game, football management game, and um, it, it just, it, basically it consisted of spreadsheets. So what music, do, what, you know, what spreadsheet music? Yes. So, you know, but then, again, that's, you see, you see the thing in, in games is that very often things are interpreted in a very literal way. So there tends to, you know, there's a tendency, less so now, but uh, historically, uh, to just play the music, play music that states the obvious. So, you know, if you're in a combat situation, well, you trigger combat music. But what gets overlooked there is that the player already knows, has a visual cue for the, for the combat. So why are you reinforcing that? I mean, there's a lot to be learned from film in that way, because, you know, maybe the most effective use of music in a battle sequence in a film is to have no music. Yeah. You know, it's what you don't do with music, or it's how you set the battle up, or how you, you know, follow that up with some music about loss or something, you know, about the aftermath of a battle. But games tend to have this kind of, it's heightening the excitement. So I think that kind of won over for a while. But then in the case of the, uh, the spreadsheet game, um, we, we sort of thought, well, it was a football game, so try and add some passion. We had this kind of operatic music in there that really sort of worked against the visuals, but it gave you this sense that it was about football and the, the passion so of football. So it was football. the Nessendorma thing was a, from yeah, Italian Yeah, exactly. It was about, uh, you know, wanting to win and things like that, but even though you're looking at the spreadsheet, but then you, you wouldn't, you know, it's just the kind of thing that doesn't happen very often, I find, in games. I'd like to move on to Republic, uh, the Revolution, Be for a number of reasons. One is stylistically. This is a, well, perhaps you can tell us what, what it is, well, it's but it, 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 obviously the subject matter dictates the, the way in which you approach the music. Yeah, I mean, this was quite hyped at the time um, because it was, a, again, a kind of um, strategy game where you had this view of a city and it was a sort of political simulation. It's sort of, um, you controlled this person who was trying to rise to power in a fictional East European state. So you were just trying to you go around recruiting people and uh, getting people on your side and campaigning and things like that. So it had this kind of um, a sort of regional flavour to it, um, but it had quite a, quite an advanced interactive music system that combined a number of these techniques. You know, the sort of horizontal splice, you know, shuffling these uh, segments. But it also had uh, kind of vertical interactive music as well, where sort of different uh, stems, layers of music were sort of shuffled as well. So they all had to be kind of compatible with one another, so you, you know, you don't know what... You, when you're writing these, you have to think about whether they're compatible with every other layer, and it's a bit of a nightmare. But it was, it was interesting.
a number of the things we've talked about so far have been really rather serious subject matters often, and uh, they're role-playing games that that are essentially rather serious and uh, dramatic, I suppose. Mm. This is slightly more tongue-in-cheek world domination. Yeah, exactly. You're just the, you know, the archetypal evil genius type Blofeld style character um, who's, again, it's a sort of god game, strategy game, this sort of top-down view and you have your minions and your lair on a remote island somewhere and you're just trying to take over the world. <laughs> That's basically it. So. Who doesn't want to do that? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what was, what was your approach musically? Um, well, I mean, it's a bit of a parody on kind of 60s spy movies. Um, and that, that's it, really. <laughs> but it had quite an elaborate interactive music system. Again, it had this kind of branching um, and lots of music for set pieces. And again, it's a sort of fairly early example of uh, orchestral music. You know, I recorded an 80 piece orchestra for this and a big band. a genius with an evil plan. You. Build your evil base. Recruit your evil henchman. When a consumer mm like myself, has a PlayStation 2 and then moves to a PlayStation 3, the quality, obviously, of the picture is obviously a lot better and more advanced. But does it make any difference to you? What are, what are the differences as far as it's so, concerned for you? Well, yeah, I mean, these days it's just... There aren't many uh, constraints, really. I mean, it's... Well, there can be under certain circumstances, you know, if it was a DS game or something. But... Um, that was the biggest problem. Uh, you know, we started recording all this uh, live music, say, you know, say at EA, uh, just calling the Royal College of Music and saying, send, you know, send some musicians over, that kind of thing. It was really fun. But then you record this stuff in a really nice studio, purpose-built studio they had. But then it all ended up mangled by the compression system they had at the time because, yeah. you know, if you think about MP3s now, they're pretty of a high quality. A lot of people can't tell the difference between those and, you know, WAVs, uh, sort of PCM samples. So um, that wrecked it, you know, introduced all these artifacts and noise and it sounded really muffled. And you used to, you used to think, well, what was the point of that? You know, you <laughs> record this orchestra and it just ends up sounding like it's underwater or something. But now you have 5.1 sound yeah. mixes. It's that go I think that's with the DVD. why it's come into it. I mean, I, I don't think the music in games has really improved that much. <laughs> it's that the industry has become more mainstream, the games have become bigger, and I think if it's, the, it's the popularity of the games, really, that kind of uh, creates, the, I mean, sort of brings about more success in the music, you know, the more mainstream it becomes. And the delivery, as I say, the quality. The, Movie tie-ins are tricky in the sense that the films are generally king. So, you know, everything is not necessarily derived from the films, but the, it's important to sort of maintain the look and feel and sound of those properties, if you like, um, simply to have the, the game world and the games identifiably connected with those franchises. Um, so. Uh, I think the, that's the hardest thing because you know that whatever, whatever music you write is going to be in the shadow of the, the film music. And that's, you know, that can be slightly upsetting because, uh, uh, you know, there's probably, there is a perception that the music in those games is actually derived from the film music, but for various legal reasons that's rarely the case. Um, music is nearly always original. It may be within the same stylistic framework but uh, it's, it's, it's generally new music, unless a specific piece of music has been licensed from the film. You know, maybe it's in, occasionally an actual recording will be used. Uh, at other times, maybe just a particular composition. So you, in the case of uh, 
Harry Potter, there's a reference to, uh, occasional reference to John Williams' Hedwig's theme, but that actually forms a very, very small part of the writing. Each company, each developer and publisher has its own culture that could be, you know, corporate culture and its approach to the business of making music and how they exploit music and expect it to be produced. And uh, also, creatively speaking, you know, the way, the time that it takes to create a game varies considerably. Some operate uh, a little bit closer to the, the film model and they go through similar stages of production, kind of pre-production, production, post-production post type model. And they'll, they, they tend to really hit their dates you know, set aside three months for the music, we'll get it done in that time, end of story, it, it comes out. That's very much like the, the sort of film industry model, I think. But other games companies uh, really take their time over the development of games. It's a very almost experimental kind of iterative process where they develop these games over a very, very long period of time. They replace, endlessly replace content and Th that's slightly harder if you're an outsider, I mean, to, the, to that particular company because you're expected to sort of, you can be expected to work on a game for, you know, upwards of a year or two. So um, in that sense, it can be quite difficult to manage the, the flow of work uh, because you never really know when, um, when music's going to be needed, how much, and you're, you're expected to be on call no matter what. So it, it, can, it varies wildly company to company. We've got to this point now where a lot of composers really are wanting to get into games too. And I'm bound to ask you, as someone who's been doing this for a long while now, what, what advice would you give to anyone who's here who might be interested in becoming a games composer? How do they do it? What should they, what should they be ready for? Oh, I, really, I wish I could. I wish I had an answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, I think it's probably the same way as uh, anyone would find involvement in the film industry or TV industry. I think you should link yourself to people who are starting out in that industry rather than um, just sort of, I don't know. Uh, it's di well, it, you know, in the film industry, it's very difficult to start at the top of something, isn't it? Uh, but it, and most relationships in films start in film school. Mm. You know, you'll have a director at a film school use a composer who's at the film school and then they'll go on and develop a working relationship. And, it, and it's like that in the film industry. I mean, partnerships, you know, some extreme examples like Spielberg and Williams and Hitchcock and Bernard Herrmann. And they go on and on working together. So I think it's like that. It's all about relationships. I don't think it's about just about the music. It's not about having a great reel or, I don't, you know, that's part of it, but I think that wouldn't, you know, probably networking is, is a key part of it, unfortunately. Primarily, you need to be easy to work with, easy to get on with. That's uh, a key part of it. Um, and I think you, you need to work to a brief. And you need to be able to write uh, the music that's actually required for the, the game you're working on. It's not a case of imposing your favorite music on a, on a game, regardless of whether it's appropriate. So stylistic appropriateness as in film and TV, is, is very significant. So um, I think you need to be able to move into new territory all the time and research music and uh, develop your technique and expand your capabilities all the time and essentially uh, be able to uh, go from the very earliest, oversee the development of music from the very earliest stages of composition right through to the final production. A lot of the big, uh, big games companies have music executives, don't they? People who are yeah. in charge of the music. I don't, it's very, there, there are very few risks taken now. So I think it is hard, you, I don't think you'd be able to leap into um, a big franchise or something, you know, an existing, yeah, I don't know, big budget game, having done nothing before, even if you're capable of doing it simply because it's just seen as a risk. So, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a way in. I just, as I say, I think getting, it's a little bit like, um, yeah, instead of going to a, a, a big music publisher, go to an up and coming band. If you want to, you know, become one of the band and then hope that you get signed. And it's the same with uh, the games industry. You get small developers and startups. Get in with those people and then, you know, be part of their journey. The one question I've left almost to last is, can you play all these games? Um, no. 
<laughs> Not really. I, I suppose you don't have to. But I think you should try. But do, do you try? Yeah, I do like games. So, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, I understand them. It's just... Um, but some of them are quite hard. Exactly. Yes. It's time, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. You're too busy writing the music for the next one to enjoy playing the previous one. Is that right? Yeah, although I do set aside time to play through. You know, there are some games that I really want to get to grips with. You know, I like action-adventure games, sort of more sort of linear games. Uh, and these sort of endless world things, uh, yeah, I, can't, I just don't, you know, I can't get into those sort of RTS things and <laughs> you just play them forever. I like there to be a beginning and a middle and an end, I think. The market is growing all the time in many areas. There's the sort of blockbuster end of it. There's the equivalent of the uh, sort of film industry's independent sector that's emerging. So there are so many outlets for music uh, and for creativity in general when it comes to the the games medium that I think it has a very, very bright future. It can only grow in significance.